You know, kids say the darnest thing, especially when it comes to the Bible and God. And in one survey conducted, the most common question that kids ask is, where does God live? Now, many pastors, Sunday school teachers, parents, and other adults have answered this simple question with the typical response, God lives in heaven. While this answer is biblical, it does not express the whole truth about where God resides. And so in our message today titled, Living Sanctuaries, we will see how God not only resides in heaven, but he also resides in every believer in Christ. But before we move on to our text, please bow with me in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we come to you today in the holy and in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you will speak through me, shed light on this scripture passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 about living sanctuaries. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture for today's message is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. And the word of the Lord reads on this wise. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Amen. Living sanctuaries. Now, when you stop and think about it, it's an amazing thing to know that God doesn't just reside in heaven, but that his spirit is actually living in you, me, and in all other believers in Christ right now at this very moment. And I'm sure that many of you have heard the praise song, Sanctuary. Or you may have even sung it in your church. The words to the song are, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Now, the word sanctuary means a consecrated place set aside as sacred and holy. It's a place of worship devoted to God. So the meaning of this song then becomes, Lord, prepare me, my body, to be a pure and holy place for you to reside. And this is the very message in our text that the Apostle Paul expressed to the Corinthian believers in Christ. We see in verse 19 of our text that the Apostle Paul describes each and every Christian as an individual temple or sanctuary where the Spirit of God resides. And if we look in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now in these verses, we're told that the physical body of every believer is a living sanctuary for the Lord. So when you combine these verses in Romans with verse 19 of our text in 1 Corinthians, then we come to the conclusion that our physical bodies are living sanctuaries and it is our reasonable service Present them as holy and acceptable unto God. That being said, for just a few minutes, I'd like to draw a parallel between the interior of a temple or church to the interior of our living sanctuaries. As I discuss three distinct sections found within the interior of a church, and they are first, the area of entry, second, the area of worship. And third, the area of holiness. Look at this. Apostle Paul founded the church in Corinth and a few years after leaving the church to establish more churches, Paul heard some disturbing reports about the Corinthian church. The problem was that after Paul left, they became full of pride. They were 
excusing sexual immorality, the spiritual gifts were being used improperly. There was a widespread misunderstanding of the key Christian doctrine that he had taught them. And so Paul wrote the letter in our text to the Corinthians in an attempt to restore the Corinthian church back to its original foundation, which was laid by Christ Jesus. Now, as we look at verse 19 of our text, we see that it said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Here Paul calls attention to something very important with the phrase, what know ye not? Then he goes on to give them three important facts that they should know about their bodies. First, he says the Holy Ghost is the proprietor or their body, which is the temple. Then Paul lets them know that their bodies, therefore, belong to God. Finally, Paul tells them that they are not their own. And so they don't have any right to just do whatever they want with their bodies. Because a Christian body is where the Holy Spirit lives. In a sense, Paul elevates our bodies to the level of being temples, holy places, living sanctuaries that house the Spirit of God. And Paul is letting the Corinthian believers know that the body is designed to be the temple of the Spirit of God. In other words, they are living sanctuaries. And because of that, he urges them to live up to their new identities in Christ. For most Christians, the church building is a sacred place of worship, praise, and fellowship. Now, keeping that in mind, the interior of our bodies, our living sanctuaries, is also a place of worship, praise, and fellowship with the Lord. And in the interior of most churches, you will find three distinct sections or areas. And this takes us to our first outline where we will discuss the first of the three sections in a church or temple, which is the area of entry. In most churches, the area of entry into the physical building is called the vestibule or foyer area. This area is not the actual sanctuary, but it is the area that leads into the sanctuary. Now, let me tell you a little about the entry area. The vestibule is a place of preparation where you stop right before entering into the sanctuary. And the vestibule is where you normally check out your clothes, your hair, or even your makeup if you're a woman to make sure everything's in order before proceeding into the sanctuary. And the vestibule also serves as a protected barrier for the sanctuary because it guards it from allowing unwanted access to things that don't belong inside of the sanctuary. So the vestibule, the area of entry into most church buildings is designed for preparation and to guard the sanctuary. Now, the bodies of our living sanctuaries also have an area of entry, but it's not called a vestibule. The area of entry into our living sanctuaries is our mind, special gift from God to be used for thinking and reasoning. Just like the vestibule in a church building is the place of preparation before entering into the sanctuary, so are our minds. The thing to know here is that before you proceed into the sanctuary, stop and prepare your minds for worship. This means clearing your mind of anything that can get in the way or hinder your praise and worship. Think of it this way. You wouldn't just barge into the office of a high official. You'd stop and prepare yourself before entering. And the same should be true when it comes to preparing your mind to enter the sanctuary. Before entering the sanctuary, prepare your mind with prayer. And not only should you prepare your mind for worship, but you must also guard your mind. Your mind should guard against whatever tries to enter your living sanctuary. In order to do that, you must guard your eye gate, your ear gate, and your mouth gate. Because these three are the doorways to your heart. You must guard the eye gate. 
what some call the wonders to the soul. You must guard that. Well, you must guard what your eyes see. You remember? Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Job wasn't going to let his eyes look at things that he shouldn't be looking at. Not only should you guard your eye gate, but you must also guard your ear gate by protecting what your ears hear. Because what enters into the ear enters into the mind and the brain and then proceeds to the heart and the spirit. So don't you remember when Eve listened to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, ate of the forbidden fruit, then gave to Adam? It put wheels of rebellion in motion and that rebellious spirit continues to this day. And then later in scripture, there was Samson who listened to Delilah and acted upon her words. Delilah lured Samson in by enticing and seducing him with her beauty. And then she deceived and betrayed him with her charming words. And because Samson didn't guard his ears, he got a costly haircut in the wrong barbershop that ultimately resulted in the loss of his life. Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 4, verse 23, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear but he also says in the very next verse, take heed what you hear, meaning you better be careful what you listen to. Because if you're not listening to the right things, you can lose a lot by acting on what you hear. So you must guard your ears. And not only should you guard your eyes and guard your ears, but you must also guard your mouth. The mouth functions as a gate with a dual purpose. It regulates both what goes into the stomach and what comes out of the heart. And we must stay away from things that try to enter through our mouths and break down our body and prevent us from being the best that we can be for the Lord. Not only should we protect what goes in, but we must be careful of what comes out. Romans chapter 3 verses 13 and 14, it lets us know that man's throat is an open tomb. His tongue is used for deceit, lips are full of poison, and his mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So things such as foul language, corrupt communication, gossiping and worthless talking have no place in our mouth. And to sum it all up, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, be read, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So guard your mouth. So in the area of the entry, in our living sanctuaries, which is our mind, we must both prepare and guard our mind. Since the spirit of God resides in our living sanctuaries, how we behave, think, and speak, what we let in through our eyes and ears become critically important because every thought, word, and deed is being done in view of the Holy Spirit. He sees it all. He sees everything. So be careful of what you expose yourself to. Now, once you have prepared yourself for worship in the vestibule, then you're ready to enter into the next section of the church where the pews or chairs are located. And this section is called the sanctuary. And this leads us to our second outline, which is the area of worship. The area of worship. Now we learn in our first outline that the area of entry in most churches is the vestibule. And now here in our second outline, we will see that the area of worship in most churches is the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the focal point or the, of the interior of the church. It is the main gathering place where praise, worship, and the preaching and teaching of God's word is done but did you know that it is possible to go to church and still miss worship? And the reason is that you didn't prepare for worship. You got up, rushed through breakfast, then rushed off to the church, then rushed into the sanctuary and took a seat. And then as you sat through the worship service, you were dozing off, dozing off because you didn't get enough sleep. 
And then on the flip side, when you're awake, you're still not focused on worshiping because your mind is wandering off, thinking about what you're going to do after the worship service is over. And then after the benediction, you walk away saying, I'm not getting fed here. I didn't get much out of this worship service today. Insinuating somehow that it was the pastor's fault. But the real problem is that you didn't come to worship prepared to worship. So today I encourage you to come to worship prepared to worship. This means getting enough sleep before you come so you will be rested and can stay alert once you arrive. Leave in plenty of time so that you don't have to rush. Pray before you come for the Lord to bless you with an undistracted mind and heart so you can focus on him and not on the mundane things going on in your life or around you. And then ask God to keep you alert so that you can exalt him in your singing. He can be exalted in your praying and in listening to his holy word. And if you do these things, guess what? You will come to worship prepared to worship. So the area of worship in a physical church building is the sanctuary. Now, for a parallel, the area of worship in our living sanctuaries is our soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And I've heard it said that God gave man a great soul and then cooped it up in a house of clay. And our soul is the area of our spiritual and emotional experiences. And scripture says we are to pour out our souls to God in Psalm 42 verse 4. Lift up our souls to the Lord in Psalm 25 verse 1. Uh, love God. With our souls in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. And then boast in the Lord with our soul in Psalm 34 verse 2. We are to praise and worship God with all of our soul in the bodies of our living sanctuary. Just like we do in the sanctuary of our physical church building. Now, as I move to the final section of the interior of a church building. We've come to the head of the sanctuary, which is the most sacred and holy area of the sanctuary. And this leads us to our third and final outline, which is the area of holiness. This section of the interior of the church is where the altar, pulpit, and baptistry reside. And this is the area of holiness because here there is a direct connection to the Lord and this connection is apparent through the prayers we render at the altar the proclaiming of the gospel from the pulpit the acceptance of Christ right before the pulpit and in the baptistry where a baptism or administered. now while the area of holiness in the sanctuary of most churches is the altar pulpit and baptistry area of holiness in the bodies of our living sanctuaries is the Holy Spirit who resides in each and every believer. Did you know the Holy Spirit is God? He's the third person in the Godhead and he gives us a direct connection to the Lord. How? Because it is the Holy Spirit who interprets our prayer. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals the word of God to us. It is the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us toward righteousness. And it is the overflowing of the Holy Spirit that compels us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord as we sing songs of praise from the choir loft and from the pew. James chapter 2 verse 26 tells us that the body without the spirit is dead. And I've heard it say that anything dead ought to be buried. So it is the Holy Spirit who connects us with God, who himself is Spirit. Therefore, we must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. In the Old Testament, Holy Spirit was often present with believers, but he did not indwell them. His presence was conditional, which is why David's prayer in Psalm 51 was, don't take away thy Holy Spirit from me. But in the New Testament, believers now have a 
permanent present paraclete, not with or among us, but within us. Then dwell in presence of the Spirit of God, proof of our salvation. And today, God dwells in believers, both individually and in the church collectively. Now, although every believer has the Holy Spirit and dwelling in him, he may be quenching the hope the Spirit of God. He may not glorify God as he should, but the fact remains that if he is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells in him. And Jesus paid the price for our sins at Calvary. His blood was the purchase price. And then, and this caused a change in the rights of ownership of the body of a believer in Christ. Because now God is the owner and landlord of our bodies. And his Holy Spirit resides in us. We each have an area of holiness in our living sanctuary. Isn't that good news? Now in closing, remember that the best abuse, sanctuary, altar, pulpit, and baptistry in our local churches were all designed to generate genuine praise and worship. Not only that, but each and every believer in Christ is also an individual living sanctuary where the Spirit of God resides. We are now God's temple, his living sanctuary, comprised of mind, soul, and spirit, all functioning as one, working in accordance with God's will and desire for genuine, authentic praise and worship. And the interior of our living sanctuaries include three distinct areas, which are first, the area of entry, which is our mind, which functions similar to a church's vestibule. To render genuine praise and worship to the Lord, we must first stop to prepare our mind for worship and guard our hearts and minds from anything that hinders our praise and worship. Second, the area of worship. Our souls and our living sanctuaries act in the same capacity as a sanctuary does in a physical church. And so we are to praise and worship God with all of our soul in the bodies of our living sanctuary, just like we do in the physical sanctuaries of our churches. Third, the area of holiness. Holy Spirit resides in the living sanctuaries of each and every believer, just like the altar, pulpit, and baptistry reside in our churches. He is our direct connection to the Lord, and his indwelling presence is proof of our salvation. Now, in the Old Testament, God abided in the tabernacle. Then in the New Testament, he abided in the temple in Jerusalem. But now in our present day, God chooses to abide and live in believers of Christ. It was through Jesus' sacrifice and victory that he made a way for God to not only dwell with his people, but for God to dwell in his people, making them living sanctuaries. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, just know that salvation is available to you today by trusting in Jesus as your Savior and receiving the forgiveness only he can offer by his grace through faith. Titus chapter 3 verse 7 says that being justified by his grace, we should be made ours according to the hope of eternal life. Once you become a believer in Christ, God's spirit will live in you too. You will then become a holy place, a living sanctuary. Living sanctuaries. Thank you and may God bless you. Please bow with me in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for blessing each believer to be a living sanctuary. We thank you for teaching us that the area of entry is our mind and the area of worship is our soul. And the area of holiness is the Holy Spirit who resides in every believer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a prayer request, like to invite the Lord into your life, or if you just have any comment, please send me a Facebook message or use the contact us option available on our website at pmbcfellowship.org. You can also contact me with your questions on today's message. To give your tithes, offerings, and donations, please visit pmbcfellowship.org. Click the Give button on the top right of the page. 
follow the instructions from there. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Thanks again for tuning in. And remember that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that your body is the temple of God, which makes you a living sanctuary. So be careful as to what it does and where it goes. Now, I look forward to you viewing our live feed on next Sunday right here at the pastor's desk or our live feed on YouTube at PMBC Space Fellowship or send you in person for Sunday morning worship on site. Providence Missionary Baptist Church in Mount Alba, Texas, being in accordance with the CDC guideline. Until then, I want you to take care and may God bless you.